Okay, so Euclidean is in Australia, and we're about 60 people. And um, right. moving on to the next slide. So originally, we weren't involved in stereoscopic displays at all. We were involved in a very different field. We were involved in point cloud data. When people drive around with laser scanners, they scan in the real world. And there's really two ways in which you can make 3D graphics. I mean, I'm sure there's more, but the two main ones. is The one is where you make everything out of flat polygons. I'm sure this audience is well familiar with that. It's like pieces of cardboard. And that particular way of doing things is very good for for computers that don't have much processing power. The other way of doing it is where you make everything out of little dots, little atoms, like the real world. And when you make things out of little atoms, then you get a more realistic shape. It doesn't have to be like uh, angular edges. But the downside is every time you have another dot, you're has to process X, Y, Z, where that dot goes on the screen. So traditionally, before we came along, if you had a tree and you put it on the screen, and then you put another tree on the screen, it would use up twice as much processing power. Our company began because we were showing whether we put one tree, two trees, ten trees, thousand trees, it used up the same amount of processing power. So before we came along, uh, software at the time was able to generally run a single house. And this sort of software was coming from companies that made laser scans. And even while they were moving them, decimating the points, pulling out 90% of them to move them around. And then when you stop, the rest of the points would go back in. We showed that there was another approach to this, a different way of doing things. Basically, we built the world's first three-dimensional search algorithm, one that went looking for points and grabbed one point for every pixel of the screen. So now it didn't matter if you had one house or 10 houses for a whole city. The computer knew how to grab exactly one point for every pixel on the screen and leave all the rest alone. If you look in the media back in 2010, we got a tremendous amount of attention, but not all of it good. Here's a company from Australia. that claimed people were building bigger Nintendos, bigger Xboxes, bigger graphics cards, because the more points you had, the bigger machine you needed to run them. And with point cloud data, that problem was many times worse. You try to point cloud data, uh, point cloud scan in an entire city. They were running them on very, very big computers. In some cases, uh, rooms full of computers. In some cases, twelve billion dollar supercomputers, crazy supercomputers, things like this. We were showing the same things running on a single laptop, and um, we began explaining. I know this looks like unlimited power. But it's just that the approach that's been taken to 3D graphics is entirely wrong. The approach was, as we have more points, we put them on the screen, and of course they cover each other up, so the whole system is highly wasteful. If you look at this city on the screen, you can see how much waste there would be in points covering points covering points. So this three-dimensional search algorithm approach ended up giving a big leap forward technology. Uh, it ended up with us building the core graphics engine that ran the French railway system. The French railway system was putting laser scanners on trains, scanning everything in. We also ended up working with making uh, the core graphics engine that runs the Tokyo Traffic Authority with Nexco. And Leica, which is one of the largest uh, creators of laser scanners, they licensed our technology and we now build the core graphics engines for software like Cyclone and Jetstream, as well as some of the products that Hexagon Corporation brings out. So our technology, uh, I suppose, gave a big boost forward to the world and allowed people everywhere to be able to run giant cities. And everyone was very pleased with that. Now, moving on, next slide should say hologram tables. We're going to move on to the next one after hologram tables. It should be a video. 
Okay, hopefully we're looking at a video now yep. of the inside of the freight station and maybe some city buildings. Looking at there is Budapest. The Hungarian government drove around Azerscan Budapest and they need 450 terabytes of data. Now, even if you have a search algorithm that's able to grab one point for every pixel, your problem is how do you load that much data into your computer. We also moved into streaming technology, the ability to take things quickly from the hard drive. Normally streaming is something that you think of when you're doing something that has a very set uh, sort of one dimensional existence. What I mean by that is say we're listening to music, the computer then can just bring in more numbers. It's one great big long line. So you can stream music. You don't have to load up the entire song. You can listen to it while it's loading in the next part. And you can stream videos because videos also, like music, are one great big long continuous line. You're streaming in the next few frames. But traditionally, people thought you couldn't stream in three-dimensional computer graphics and certainly not ones made out of because in a long continuous stream, it, it's a little bit all over the place. A map. Imagine I have in my computer that way. You could imagine in a scene with trees up front, hills further away, a village up a distance, in a big it has to jump around in my, inside the hard drive. And hard, and hard drives normally don't work that way. Way, 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 I'd a hard drive block of data and then start reading the, reading the next block of data. I made this ability to stream in anything of any style. Once again, people thought this was in miracle. If you can plug in 450 terabytes into a laptop and it's 0 0.8 seconds, you're seeing the entire city. You can go go wherever you get that road forward. Okay, moving on. Moving on to, okay, virtual reality, as we know, has been a long time, but in the last, let's say, 10, ten years, ten years of, uh, but um, virtual reality, I suppose, even though at the beginning, some people were saying, the future of virtual reality will be everyone will use virtual reality helmets everywhere. They showed pictures of, of the classroom of the future, where all the children are wearing virtual reality helmets for many of their lessons. They showed boardrooms of the future with people all wearing virtual reality helmets to look at new designs or, or discuss things. The reality, of course, turned out quite different to that. There are not many cases where you can say the board has gathered together in a company and all the, the <laughs> older people have put on their virtual reality helmet. There aren't even many cases where you can say military, their defense planning are wearing virtual reality helmets. We have a lot of our customers who are using our unlimited point cloud data engine and loaded instantaneously come to us and say that third dimension is very important to them. If in so many different um, fields, planning, having that extra information, I suppose, uh, really does add a, an added benefit. Um, a few notable examples is fire. <laughs> when they actually go looking for how to put out fires, the slope of the hill is very, very important because fire travels much quicker up hill than it does down, depending on the slope of the hill. Uh, that depends on how fire spreads. In military, they said it was always very important. They couldn't just look at a map of the ground, uh, like an aerial map from looking down. Having all the wrong heights, trees, buildings, and all sorts of things was very important in war zone. And generally, of course, a lot of people just liked the third dimension. They felt that that was the natural progression of technology. In some ways, it was a little bit of a luxury. But we had a lot of our customers say to us that virtual reality was really for them. Um, one comment I heard was, virtual reality is like Egypt. 
It's a lovely place to visit, but you don't want to live there. They said, wearing a virtual reality helmet, you, you give someone a virtual reality experience, a virtual reality helmet, and you say, what did you think? You say, I loved it. And rightfully so. Work that's been put into virtual reality, it's a very impressive experience. But then when you say to them again next week, okay, let's do it again. They say, no, I did it last week. I do, I do need to do the same thing every day. I had my fun. It was enjoyable. I liked it. But, and this is, I mean, certainly everyone has their own opinion on this. But certainly when we look at the, if you type to Google, virtual reality, uh, you know, virtual reality problems, virtual reality decline, and any of these things, you get a lot of studies, you get every, well, almost every major media group in the world saying virtual reality with the headsets on our head hasn't exactly met the, uh, hasn't exactly met the use case, the, the, the common usage that people earlier were saying. So we decided maybe let's look at this problem a little bit differently. My mother told me, don't sit too close to the TV. And virtual reality is where, of course, you have screens with your eyes very close. And there was always another form of virtual reality that was growing alongside virtual reality. And that was where you had some sort of display, you were tracking people, and you were altering that display according to the position of the person. Um, it's the, the core of, of what normally makes uh, VRK. So we said maybe the screens are in the wrong places for a boardroom setting or for any sort of setting where there is discussion. Now, of course, when you wear a virtual reality helmet or an augmented reality helmet, then you can have multiple people and they can be seeing the same thing. One could be on one side of a table, Another could be the other side of the table, and one could see the front of the building, and the other could see the back of the building. If they've done the tracking right, if there was a dinosaur on the table, and I put my finger on the dinosaur's nose, another person could be on the back of the dinosaur, but still reach his hand over and put his finger in the same place on the dinosaur's nose, if it tracked correctly. And this, of course, was a downside to when you have a display a stereo projector or a screen that's been tracked and repositioned to the position of the user. And so for that reason, we thought maybe there's a way to cure this problem. Let's move on to the next slide. Well, the next slide is just showing some glasses first, a, a virtual reality helmet looking at. Um, we'll move on to the next one. So there's a video here. And the video was made using a tracked camera. So the camera's tracked. And the camera, as it's tracked, is showing what those people are actually seeing on the table. Moving on to the next slide. And the next slide should show flowers. Just want a bit of confirmation. I'm in the dark here. We see two flowers. Confirmed. Good. Good, good, good. OK. Why are there two flowers? That's actually the secret to our technology. So you can see in the picture, we have one person on one side of the table, say he's middle, and another person on another side of the table, say he's east, okay? And they're looking at the table. Someone might uh, question this picture. From the position of the tracked camera, it would not have seen the buildings rising that high. They would be correct. However, from the position of the users, they would see the buildings rise that high. So you know, there's that, the picture is actually from the view of people. That is what they're seeing. Now, how is it that if you have one screen, one display, that one person can be looking at the buildings on the east side, whilst another person is looking at the buildings from the north side? I mean, if that display was a screen, you had one person on one side and another person on the opposite side, that display can either make the front of the building or can make the back of the building. But it certainly wouldn't be able to do both at the same time. That's where we played in an unusual area. Uh, we were looking at the eyes of insects. 
I'm sure many of you know, insects see a different spectrum of light, a different spectrum of color to what we see. So when the bee sees that yellow flower, we see a yellow flower. But it actually sees a white flower with the red marking sort of a Many flowers, in fact, this is probably not the best example. I might change the power next time. Many flowers have even little arrows, have all sorts of markings guiding the insect to the center where pollen is. And so we decided to work in this field, changing the, the light wave spectrum so that we would use special crystals in the projector. So this hologram table is a just short throw projector a display on the table, and we put special crystal filters on the projectors. The one crystal filter bends the light waves as such, so that one person wearing the glasses will have a sort of an anti-crystal filter that will bend the light wave back, and the other person will be given a different uh, crystal filter bending the light wave to a spectrum that then comes back. And so the two people the one projector, the one person will only see what that projector does, and the other person will only see what that projector does. On top of that, they have the normal, um, you know, stereoscopic flashing one eye black, the other eye black, give them the normal 3D. So it's that with a layer of crystal over the top. That allows people to be able to walk around the table and feel like they're seeing the same thing. But it also means that they don't have to have something very heavy on their heads to discuss uh, the same object. Moving on to the next slide. So Bentley, the luxury car company, they use this technology for people to design cars at the Grand Prix. Holograms are very much associated with luxury. And so being able to design cars, change the wheels, change the colors, change various features of the car, that worked very nicely. Moving to the next slide, I should say Hong Kong Airport. Hong Kong Airport wanted to be able to zoom in and out very, very, very big models using our point cloud data engine. So they zoom in out, in and out of very, very big cities and they've connected all their planes live via GPS. So they actually see their planes coming and going. Many of our customers do this. Some of them do buses, some of them do taxis, some of them do aeroplanes, some of them do police cars. But it allows them to have a point cloud data model of their entire city, in some cases, their entire country. And then they can have all the cars, buses, everything travel around live. Next one is Qatar military. Oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> So, some of the defense forces around the world have been using wooden tables, little wooden tanks. Um, I saw something recently on an episode of Game of Thrones. Things haven't changed much in a long time. To plan their defense. Of course, when you're planning over a very large area, you need a very big table. The hologram table, that ability to bring in laser scans or photogrammetry data, unlimited amounts, and be able to zoom in and out and use a hologram table is wonderful for planning defense. Okay, the next slide should say hologram booms VR games. Let's have a discussion here about the word hologram. So, I suppose I'm myself a little bit on the fussy end of science. You know, when I see something that isn't right, I say, that's not right. Can't you all see this? For example, I remember when Apple brought out the, the iPhone. They had increased in one of their iPhones the resolution by 20%. And instead of advertising the resolution has increased by 20%, it's now 960 pixels horizontally, they said, it's retina vision. One pixel for every cone of your eye. If hold it back about 70 centimeters of your face. Now, of course, everyone went, wow, good job, retina vision. I said, my goodness, this is terrible. If I sit in my lounge room far enough back, I have retina vision, 
because the phone is only covering a tiny little section of the cones of my eyes. Everybody thought I was fussing over nothing. Leave them alone. Stop bursting their bubble. The word hologram, I think, has a similar reaction in a lot of people. A lot of people say back in the 70s, people made rainbow stickers that we see on our Visa cards, little, the little bird. That is a hologram and nothing else is a hologram. So in modern times, I suppose what's happened is people have seen TV shows like Star Wars, Star Trek, project things and TV shows call them holograms. When you say to a young person, there's R2-D2 making Princess Leia, what's that? It's making a hologram. I don't see people then say, no young person, a hologram is a rainbow skirt from the 70s. Hologram in its original Greek or holo, whole, ram, picture, generally, I suppose, has grown to a new usage, as so many words do. The word now basically means whole picture. It's gone back to the original Greek meaning. If you have an object, and I can move around the object, see it from different sides, then in movies, that's a hologram. And likewise, groups like Microsoft, ourselves, so many others, we might have gone in this direction because the word hologram is one that relates better with the public. You say, would you like a VRK? They half the time, do you know what that is? Do you want a hologram room? They say, oh, oh yes, I know what that is. That's like something where it's going to make objects that look solid and I can walk all around them. So I would go so far as to say, um, I can certainly understand those who say we need to keep uh, words, particularly science, solid in their meanings. But the word hologram to the general public, and that's how dictionaries are made, what does the majority think this word is? The word hologram has moved on, or maybe moved forward, but rather moved back to its original Greek meaning, whole picture. We walk around an object, we see it from all sides, it is a whole picture. Okay, moving on, there should be a video of a lady in one of our hologram rooms. And once again, this footage is um, where we have a tracked camera. We are reprojecting from the position of the camera. As that hologram room was closing, perhaps you noticed the shape. Let's move on to the next slide. So when we began to give up on VR, but find that our customers really wanted 3D, and we basically try and, and to some degree we're creating terms. When we say VR, we try and push that to mean VR helmets. We say holograms, we push that to mean tracked displays. I think we're pushing that mean, and I think we've actually had a, a quite a good level of success with it educating people these these two distinct differences. VR means helmets, holograms mean track displays. Maybe people might disagree with us doing that, but that's at least how we've been creating that distinction so far. Okay, when we went down the road making VR caves, uh, one of the, I suppose, major issues with making a VR cave is there isn't an affordable way to make screens the size of walls. So you have to use projectors. And the biggest issue with projectors is the stronger your projector, the brighter your image, but the stronger your projector, the more the light that bounces off that wall onto other walls will make that image look um, dim. Not because the image truly is dim, but because the black parts of the image that don't have any light have received some of the light bouncing onto them. So, one of the things at the moment that separates us from what other people are doing is if you look at the VR cave on the left, the picture of a white rectangle missing side, assume we're on the right slide, and then you look at the one on the right. The one on the right is a half trapezium. And that's how we make our VR caves because as you can see, one on the left, the light hits the back wall and it bounces onto another wall at 60% of the light bounce 
then I suppose washes out that act. Whereas when you make a trapezium shape, you make it so that the angles are such that the light bouncing off these balls never end up really hitting another quite so severely. And that actually makes a very big difference to the sort of projectors you could use. Rather than have very big projectors, I mean, some VR capes, perhaps you've seen, around about the two to three million dollar mark. Yet we're using normal ultra short -pro projectors. And by simply not having the light bounce onto itself, we're getting a similar degree of contrast at a at an like significantly cheaper price. Okay, moving on to the next slide. And the next slide should show some red circles and some green circles. Confirmed. On the uh, representations of the VR caves. So the one on the left has lots of red circles. I was surprised when I went on a bit of a VR cave tour at how many cameras many of these VR caves had all around the place in many different areas. And a lot of that came from the fact that the cameras had a very narrow field of view. Now, if they tried putting a lens on the camera to increase the field of view, it greatly affected the accuracy of the camera. Infrared cameras, like most cameras, function best with a narrow field of view, so people simply had a lot of cameras. And I looked at this and wondered why things were as they were, and we've chosen a different direction forward. When you have lots of cameras, those cameras, if they even move a slight amount, they can greatly affect the computer's understanding of where you are. So if I have a track wand in my hand and I want to spin it, that sort could be 20 centimeters out of my hand because one of the cameras slightly moved. In the green picture, we have two collections of cameras that are facing out in all directions. Let's look at that in more detail. So the next slide should show uh, some glasses and wand pictures and a, a funny looking black device with lots of cameras on it down in the bottom corner. We weren't overly satisfied with the tracking solutions that were available. So we went down the road of building our own. If you look down at the bottom left, there is what we call a tracking dome, something that we've produced ourselves. Andrew, can you tell me when sort of uh, we're getting close to the last 10 minutes? Because <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, I haven't been following the time at all, I'm afraid. Okay. 19 so minutes. When we're looking at... You've got 19 minutes. Sorry, I'll keep talking. Yep, keep talking. I thought you said something. Okay. So when we look at the tracking dome, down in the corner, that's got 15 little infrared cameras on it. Now, one of our dissatisfactions with existing tracking systems was that the amount of processing power that was used, if you had 30 cameras and each one is a bitmap image, and you're going through that bitmap image looking for bright points, then that ended up being a lot of computer processing power. We looked at HTC Vice tracking. Uh, we looked at the amount of processing power that it took up. And uh, of course, that came much later. <laughs> we already built ours by the time so by the time that came on. We decided to go with a different direction. There's two sorts of cameras when it comes to infrared. The one is where it actually gives an infrared bitmap picture, like a normal camera would. The other's where it just returns the brightest XY point. It doesn't turn a picture for the computer to process, it simply returns the brightest point, X and Y, two numbers. Now, that sounds great. Now, your computer doesn't have to do a ton of processing, but of course, the downside is when you are tracking a person's position, you don't have one bright point, you have quite a few. Normally, you would say you have three, except with a gravity sensor, you can get away with two. So, as you can see, when we're using a hologram table, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lights. So, if we're using little cameras that are only picking up the 
the x, y, then how do we do it? Well, the answer is we flash the lights. I was surprised this worked, but 360 times a second, we go flash one, flash two, flash three, flash four, flash five, flash six, flash six, et cetera, and then we repeat. And inside the cable is like a little heartbeat that at the end of the eight flashing, sends out a big flash, tells everything, repeat cycle. We patent this technology because it works so well. It gives very accurate tracking. It doesn't ever have to be recalibrated because you don't have individual cameras quite jointed from each other all over the room. Where the cameras are in the device is where they stay. At the beginning, it's calibrated by computer, so each dome, because look how small those cameras are. They're like little bricks. So when we make it, even the act of making it, you're going to have the slightest little alteration when those little cameras are put in. So calibrate uh, with a special calibration process afterwards that looks at them all, works out exactly where they are, and then gives that information to the dome. And so this seemed to be a um, much better, more reliable way of doing tracking. Okay, moving on to the next slide, it should say one computer with clever software. I once heard it said from one I went to to see the ERK, having an ERK is like owning a helicopter. You need a full time maintenance group to keep it operational. And they said that very proudly, see? Because of all the maintenance, it's like a helicopter. Anyone who's worked with VR caves would know that they have uh, are often associated with difficulties in reliability. But, um, we were, I suppose, very ambitious. We were trying to get to the point where the company made a cheap VR cave that would have unlimited power using our graphics engine, so it would be more powerful than the VR caves that people generally had seen. And our biggest challenge was reliability. Now, generally, if you have one computer, you know the reliability of that. If your one computer has four outputs, four projectors, you know the reliability of that. Computers have been built to take four monitors or four outputs. As soon as you start moving into more computers being together, there's a lot of questionability for how well that behaves. So it was vital to us to keep everything on one computer. That's where our algorithm comes in as being so important. When, when you build very clever software that can run things of enormous sizes, even when you're making a VR cave where you've got 2,000 resolution on four screens and that has to be stereoscopic, you've got it twice each eye, that's tremendous amount of output. So keeping with one computer and very clever software has been the key to our reliability. Moving on to the next slide, hologram and entertainment. Um, of course, the biggest difference, I suppose, between academia and um, business is that academia is funded to do R&D and promote science, to push the barriers of science, whereas business sort of has to do that by, by actually bringing things to the point where they make a lot of money. VR Cave, we looked at the other groups around the world and selling VR Caves, and it looked like a lot of work. And we felt we were going down the road of making bikes and selling them. Potentially, one of the best markets would be entertainment. So we set up um, what you would know as a VR Cave, set up a lot of them. Actually, in Australia, we have 40 of them. We have VR caves in our entertainment center. Any other place in the world has VR caves in one conglomerate collection. We opened it up to the public, and we tried two trials, one where each person goes in one room, and one where people go in as a group, but they take turns. You know, they wear untracked glasses and sit back, so things are a little bit distorted, but it's pops over, like they go through 10 different experiences and says, please swap to the next person with the tracked glasses. We found that one works much better. People really like the social aspect of seeing their friends do interesting things. So we opened up a dinosaur entertainment center. Let's move to the next slide, which should be a video. 
So this is our dinosaur entertainment center, and it has some uh, hologram room, and families pay about $100, and they go in and they go through 10 different dinosaur experiences. They fly through the air with the pterodactyls, they go underwater, they pick up holographic grass and feed it to a brontosaurus. And of course, we make these things uh, very interactive. Having the, having the main person being tracked means that we can have the characters often look into your eyes. And that's sometimes the difference between people feeling like the character's alive or not. If I spoke to you and slightly looked over your shoulder to the left and hello everybody, you wouldn't feel like I was a living person. But with these characters, because we know where your eyes are, we can make the characters look directly to your eyes, and so they feel very, very lifelike. Okay, so that actually did very well. I made uh, over $100,000 in the first month. And we're now actually opening up a franchise of those all over Australia, New Zealand, and the rest of the world, because we're looking at the sort of money it's making in entertainment. It's a, a extremely good business. Moving on to the next slide. Now, the next slide should show a video of a person standing with the word hollow sports moving all around him. This one's a bit of a nicer video because the others were all re-projected from the position of the camera artificially. They were footage being reprojected out of the computer from the position of the camera. Whereas this footage with the hollow sport that we're bringing out next month, this is where we're actually just filming the room directly with the cameras over the, uh, sorry, with the glasses over uh, the mobile phone camera. So it gives, I suppose, in a way, a more honest impression of what people see when they play holographic sports. Of course, for entertainment, that uh, that first time you see something like a robot in the room, and then you put your hand straight through them, there's a sensation you feel, like, oh my goodness, my hand's gone into something solid. I remember one lady, we hit a wall, it came up halfway, and we asked her to walk through it. She walked through it, then afterwards said, is that safe? Are those particles going through giving me cancer? Has this been properly tested? Because, of course, from her perspective, she felt she was dealing with something solid. You can probably see the person playing ping pong that just came up uh, maybe a second or two ago now. The fact that our tracking is keeping that bat in your hand and that table isn't there, it's not real, it's holographic as well. You can even play ping pong gives, I suppose, a good example of how far we've come with this technology. Okay, moving on to the next slide, holographic tours. This is where I feel a tinge of guilt regarding the word holographic. This is where my business people say, it's a good word. People are using it in marketing everywhere. I don't know if my conscience will bear that forever. We might change holographic scores before we release it next month. Basically, what we're looking at here was created according to need. In business, sometimes you say, what does everyone want? We'll make that rather than what we want to make. So what's happening here? Well, this person has, they're going through a real world environment. And that real world environment has been recorded with a 360 camera, but the 360 camera has stereoscopic depth. And then we've put a tremendous amount of work into, I suppose, going outside, setting up objects for exactly a meter high, and fine tune everything thing to its exact size in the real world. And you can be amazed at the effect that this has on people. When I go to the movies and I watch Spider-Man and his head is as big as the screen, I know I'm not really there because people's heads aren't that big. But when you put people in front of a 3D display where everything's been recorded, but it's been recorded and then calibrated to exact real-world sizes, they all find it very, um, almost disturbing in a way. Like, one of the parts is, if you use this and you're doing something daytime, and then you come out of it and you see it's night, a lot of people have this sudden, what happened? It was day as 
and they go, oh, wait a minute. No, no, that was just the thing I was doing. Because when you fine tune everything perfectly, you get a really, really good result. Now, what we've done is we've taken, say, we're doing um, City, say we're doing Machu Picchu. We go in and we scan up and down each row in both directions. Scan is the wrong word. We travel with a, we walk with a 360. Let's move on actually to the next slide. We'll see the device. Nope. The next fire. <laughs> That's not the one I wanted. That's okay. Um, we'll leave it anyway. It's going to say 2K, 4K, 8K. Get to that in a second. Okay. So we have people and they walk around with a 360 camera. All right. To avoid confusion, the current slide is 2K, 4K, 8K with the box. Talk about that in a second. So we have a person walking around with a 360 camera. Go up and down each road. And then we'll have some clever software, and that clever software will take that video footage and bring in a, a two-dimensional picture of a map and add the video footage from here to that road, from here to here that road, and the intersection point. Now the person traveling has a wand in their hand. 360 view, they can look up, they can look down, they can look left or right. If they turn around to go backwards, lines of space in the video that will back in another direction. They can travel forwards and backwards, up and down the roads. Now, when they reach an intersection, they choose which way they want to go. And it works just by leaning the wand in that direction. It automatically goes in that way. So the person uses even though it's a video, they feel it's more like a computer game because they can go wherever they want. Now, this, this is a good piece of technology, but um, we had to do quite a lot of work to get it to the point where it is. At the moment, most of the videos that you watch are 2K, and they call that high definition. There's a lot of talk of things moving to 4K at the moment, with some applications moving to 4K, with eventual talk of things moving to 8K. Now, we have built an 8K video codec. In fact, if we move to the next slide, the next slide should have a big X32 in red and a little computer, a little computer. Because we're stereoscopic and because it's three video that goes all the way around, every single frame had double 8K. And a lot of people are asking, how have we done this? Well, remember, we practiced on memory streaming when we were dealing with point cloud data of giant cities. So when it came to building video codecs, we had a lot of tricks that others haven't found yet. So whereas most of the world is still back there in that 2K realm, we're 32 times ahead with double 8K for every single frame. When you have a look at Google Earth, you get a, an 8K uh, photo bubble, panorama bubble, but then it does like a whoosh effect to the next one. We're doing that 30 times a second, and we do it on a little thousand-dollar computer. So Bruce, there's so, uh, five minutes left. Um, I think that that's very much a, uh, something that people have been wanting for a long time, a good way to replay the real world. So looking at the next slide, there should be a person walking around with a strange black stick, and uh, there's some lasers on the ground. Those are used for calibration. So we know where we are as we walk around. And of course, this sort of technology is very good for history preservation. It's very good for um, uh, holographic tours of tourist sites. Um, some people suggest a use case for where people are physically disabled or elderly to be able to have a look around some environments. We're going to try that one out, induction and safety training. But the main use we have is asset management. So many companies say, I own lots of shopping for lots of hotels. I own too many that I don't even know what they look like. Four minutes, Bruce. The device, this big uh, projected onto a wall in a company with these holographic, and once again, I apologize for holographic there, because it isn't holographic. It isn't an object that you see around from all sides. I'll, I'll, I have to think about that one. I have to see how I'll, I'll feel on judgment day about using the word there. Okay, it's a stereoscopic interactive uh, uh, video, basically. Okay, so uh, most of our customers, the ability to have all of their assets, 
in a way that they could show it off to others. In some cases, they have factories that are far away, and they want to show visitors their factories um, and give them like a little bit of a tour. Stage holograms. So a lot of people contact us and they say, we would like to put a hologram on a stage. We say, you can't do that. Hologram is a thing that you can see from all sides. They say, but Michael Jackson did it. But Tupac did it. They brought Michael Jackson back from the dead with it. We say, why is it that we put a projector on a wall? That's not bringing Michael Jackson back from the dead. But you put a projector on a piece of silk screen and suddenly you have the power of God himself. But after so many people approaching us saying, I'd like to have something that a whole big audience can see, we went down this road. But we felt guilty about just putting a projector onto a silk screen. So we actually found, and this is quite interesting, but we just didn't have time to go through it. We actually found a way to project these things with the depth, without any glasses, provided you're three meters away. If you were in the room looking at that right now, that would be two meters thick to you, and your brain would not believe otherwise. Fortunately, we'll have to move on from that one. Okay, we moved into the area of making hologram arcade machines or entertainment, once again. Um, it's basically just the hologram table put to uh, a more commercial use. And um, I won't talk about content we want from that. Let's say we're done. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, okay.